Hey, it's Mike here, and today I just have to respond to some of the Seaspiracy debunks. Mainly, I'm gonna focus on one, but in case you didn't see, it reached number one on Netflix in a bunch of different countries and top 10 on the US, I think maybe even top five in the US, so that's incredible, and it clearly triggered the fishing industry and many individuals and led them to create responses, as I predicted in my previous video. Yes, I'm late as usual, but this gives me an opportunity to see all of the responses and it's clear that a lot of people have chosen to just focus on a couple of statistics and, and knock them down. And so we're gonna respond to that as well as just the logic that is used to try and dismiss this documentary and continue business as usual, eating fish as usual. Or in the industry's words, keep eating fish or I'll throw you overboard. Is it too early to make those jokes? Probably, anyway. First of all, major props to Ali Tabrizi, who I now refer to as Ali C. Breezy and his partner Lucy, for actually going there and doing it, for going and being on those raids of fishing ships that were illegal in Liberia, being in the Faroe Islands for those whale hunts and stuff. That was brutal. They were there much better than just talking into a camera from your basement. I don't know who does that. But with everything they put in there and in like other documentaries where vegans try to share their message or ask people to consider not eating animals, of course there was that major clap back and the best, most common angle of attack is to make vegans out to be the villains. Yes, those scary carrot eaters. For example, in an attempt to make the documentary look extremist, this random guy on Instagram with a following went as far as to say the sort of finger pointing going on in these vegan documentaries in general actually promotes genocidal tendencies. And I'm just worried that these false factual propaganda films may just get people thinking about genocide rather than going vegan. Yes, the ones who define their lifestyle as reducing harm as much as is practically possible to living beings, they're the, they're the dangerous ones. But of course, if you can label this as dangerous vegan propaganda, then you can simply dismiss every concern in the movie and continue gobbling down our fishy friends just as you were and continue paying these industries. But the response I wanna focus on the most, just because it was probably the most wide sweeping in terms of its attacks on Seaspiracy is from Sustainable Fisheries. This is directly from the fishing industries written by a woman named Emily D'Souza. And they say it was, quote, nothing more than self-indulgent vegan propaganda. Its claims are unsupported by science and it does little to help the causes it wants to support. Bitter much. First of all, you simply can't say it's not supported by science. There was way more science that was cited in this documentary, referenced in this documentary, than the vast majority of documentaries out there. So I don't mind having some debate about how science is interpreted, and that's what we're about to do, look at scientific interpretation. But the main thing I want you to be thinking about through all of these is, does it actually change the message of the movie if there's a slight variation on some of these or a different study showing a slightly different number? And the first one is that the write-up claims to you know, dismantle this plastic ocean fishing nets concern. And of course from the movie, which she claims is misinformation that 46% of plastic in the ocean is from fishing nets. They say the truth is by weight, 46% of plastic in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch was estimated to be from fishing nets, but there's some serious nuance like how plastic floats versus sinks. It's a major straw man, plastic straw pun intended because, you know, she says the whole ocean in the myth part, but the movie specified very clearly the Pacific, so that's just a mistake. Yes, she takes the angle that because they took samples from the surface and that she suspects that there would be a lower portion of fishing nets underwater, that this is an overestimation. That somehow these fishing nets just aren't a concern, well, that is Ridiculous, yes, fishing nets are extremely dangerous. We'll talk about sea turtle bycatch issues later on, but it's worth mentioning that, you know, all of these different videos of turtles being rescued from fishing nets, you know, a lot of them show turtles underwater. Those wouldn't be measured in the study. I mean, look at this guy. Does that look like it's on the surface of the ocean? No, thankfully, again, that turtle was rescued, so we can rejoice. These underwater nets can be referred to as ghost nets, and a lot of them are actually caught on coral reefs and disconnected. And from Mission Blue, quote, when caught on a reef, nets do not only catch fish, turtles, crustaceans, birds, or marine mammals, they also destroy hard and soft corals, wiping out complete ecosystems while swaying in the current. Like this one ton ghost net removed from the Maldives, no joke. But can you imagine being the person who defends how 46% of these large plastic pieces in the Pacific Gyre are fishing nets. Like, 
Ah! You only do that when you're being paid to do that, and it's shameful. Anyway, moving on. Next one, misinformation. One in three fish imported into the U.S. is caught illegally. She says, truth, this estimate is based on import data from 2011 that has since been significantly corrected, and she says it's controversial, blah, blah, blah. First of all, the paper this is from has not been retracted or anything like this, and by correction, she's actually talking about an opinion paper that was written later on. Now, this isn't some major organization. This is just a rough calculation based on loose figures of consumption and the U.S. fish catch. And it's saying that, oh, we've actually been importing less fish than they quoted in that original paper of 90%. Is this estimate life-changing? Well, it goes from instead of 20 to 32% of imports being illegal, it's 14 to 22% being illegal so instead of you know one in three bites of fish that you're taking being illegal you know maybe it's one in five bites so yeah we should just continue everything as normal yeah emily echoes that this 90 percent import figure is overestimated well tell that to your fellow fishing industry from national fishermen quote according to noaa which is the u.s government the united states imports more than 90 percent of the seafood the public consumes but going back to the main original one in three study at hand the main point still remains and that is things like, quote, opaque supply chains foster illegal seafood, especially Chinese reprocessing, where they can even be illegally catching fish in the U.S., shipping it to China, and then shipping it back. The conclusion is the same. There's a lot of illegal fish in the U.S., so even if you're trying to be a do-gooder fish consumer, uh, yeah, it's kind of a lost cause. Now for the big fish, the 2048 figure, she says, misinformation. That's her voice, misinformation. <laughs> the oceans will run out of fish by 2048, but truth, monitored fish populations are going up. First of all, there's a little bit of a straw man going on here because Ali was referring to how he learned about this statistic and that scared him. And yes, it is in the literature, hasn't been retracted. And he also says virtually all fish. And that's important because, well, historically, the media has paraphrased this as fishless oceans. What they're talking about is a total collapse of the main fished species in the ocean, which isn't that crazy when you consider that, for example, 90% of all large fish in the ocean are gone in terms of population. But that brings me to the original study, which is this one. Again, not retracted, but instead cited 3,000 times. Still in the journal Nature, and this chart, which is often shown from it, isn't even a chart of prediction. It's what has happened up to the time of the study. So as the study says, the main quote here, this trend is of serious concern because it projects the global collapse of all taxa currently fished by, yep, 2048. Point is that we're seeing the collapse of a ton of different fish species and a lot of trends are not looking good. So are you gonna say, oh, well, not everything is gonna totally collapse. So let's just keep eating fish as is. No, that's completely insane. The point here is that the industry wants you to think that there's abundance of fish in the ocean so that you keep buying it and they keep profiting. And this is particularly illustrated by how National Geographic might title an article saying the sea is running out of fish. And then literally a few months later, the fishing industry says fish populations around the world are improving. And the study they cite in that and that Emily cites is this one. Talks about fish stocks that are improving. Well, quote, all authors are involved in fisheries management or provide fisheries advice in ways that can be viewed as competing interests. Adding to that, the RAM legacy database that they use is funded by the fishing industry, including Walmart, who obviously sells a lot of fish. So you have to just take the industry's word for it. And even if you do, we can look at it and see it's being portrayed as better than it really is. Claim here is that a bunch of these fisheries are improving and that's great, everything is looking up, but we have to actually look at the entire world here and it's important to note that they didn't. The paper admits that they really have no idea what's going on with half of the fish stocks in the world and they suggest that things are much worse. And looking to the database itself, you can see from their map that they make it seem like large chunks of the ocean are improving if you're not looking too closely. Maybe this was an accident, maybe it wasn't, but if you actually start dissecting which fisheries they're talking about and compare them to an actual global map, well, maybe Canada's coast and the US West Coast isn't like the entire half of the Pacific Ocean looking to this map from UCSB. We can see fishing activity throughout the whole world. And what you're seeing there is coastal activity, which isn't insignificant, but parsing out the results from that original map, I have added red, which represents all the fishing areas where there is a long-term decline, and then also adding a little bit of purple in ones that have flatlined at a low biomass level. And this is what you get. This is not an ocean where everything is trending good. 
And on their facts page, Seaspiracy actually responded to this 2048 criticism, and you can just go there and read it. But another really good point that they made was that about a decade later, the main author of the original study in 2016, averting a global fisheries disaster, again found the outlook very poor, summarizing that population health had in fact declined since his original study, and that 88% of stocks would be overfished and well below their target biomass by 2050. Next one is she says the claims of Seaspiracy about bycatch, which they say is 40% of all catch, is overblown. She says, no, it's actually 10%. And yeah, it probably is the case that the 40% was a bit of a high estimate, but the 10% one she puts in there is also a low estimate. Even as Oceana says, it doesn't take into account things like the observer effect where things are changed because people are watching. So yeah, it probably is somewhere between 10 and 40%. The main issue is that it is too much by catch and by kill. I mean, in shrimp, they're often throwing away more fish than they are catching in terms of shrimp, super destructive. Also, a new study found that bottom trawlers caught 42% more fish than previously thought, and trawling is very high bycatch. Also, we don't care if animals make it on the ship for bycatch. It's also about that bykill around the ship. We're talking about bulldozing the seafloor, which is an unimaginably huge effect. And it was likely responsible for mass dolphin deaths like this one, even in the UK. So will we ever get an accurate number for bycatch? Probably not. Either way, as the FAO mentioned in 2018, quote, a large portion of fisheries and aquaculture production is either lost or wasted 35% of the global harvest, which just reinforces the waste in this system. Next, she says it is a myth that 250,000 sea turtles are killed from the fishing industry. This is not the verbal claim of the movie, but I actually have to give her a little bit of slack here because they left sea turtle death text at the top of the chart after the 1,000 plastic deaths part while verbally specifying something else, which as you can hear here is... A global study estimated a conservative 1,000 sea turtle deaths from plastic per year. However, in the United States alone, 250,000 sea turtles are captured, injured, or killed every year by fishing vessels. Emily says the 250,000 figure has been updated with a newer figure by the same authors, and that figure is just a mere 4,600, but there are several issues here. You know, the original one was 250,000. The updates after new technology and everything is still 140,000. That is too high. That has a lot of issues as we'll cover, but that actual paper says, our estimates represent minimum annual interactions and mortality because our methods were conservative and we could not analyze unobserved fisheries potentially interacting with sea turtles. So that should be rephrased with the US fishing industry kills a minimum of 4,600 sea turtles a year. And need I remind you, six out of seven are threatened or endangered, which funny, she didn't try to debunk or anything. But the biggest problem with this estimate is that it is not counting these secondary deaths from things like ghost nets or just that interaction that is dangerous with fishing gear or even being hit directly by the fishing boats. From this 2015 study of 230 dead turtles investigated in Hawaii, quote, most turtles died from fishing induced or boat strike trauma followed by infectious slash inflammatory diseases, nutritional problems from weakness and an array of physiologic problems. That would not be counted in the study and that's an unknown probably pretty large amount of sea turtles i mean it's kind of ironic because in hawaii it's actually illegal to touch sea turtles when you are swimming yet the fishing industry is killing thousands of them but to zoom out to the big picture here which is really the most important is that that 250,000 figure and that huge amount of deaths probably still a good reflection of what is going on in the rest of the world where they haven't implemented higher technologies to prevent turtle deaths. You have to remember, even in the US, the majority of fish, no matter which way you slice it, are being imported. And so from this study, which is five years newer than the newer study she cited, <laughs> Quote, for some depleted species such as the leatherback turtle, as well as a bunch of amazing creatures like the albatross and the vaquita, which is the smallest cetacean known in other animals, fisheries bycatch has been identified as the single largest threat to these populations. And furthermore, that high intensity sea turtle bycatch was most prevalent in three fishing areas, Southwest Atlantic, Eastern Pacific, and the Mediterranean. So as I suspected, a huge problem, and those fish are still getting into the US. So by buying fish in the US, you are still supporting a massive amount of sea turtle death, no matter which way you slice it, don't slice turtles. I also wanna be clear, when I'm talking about sea turtles and cetaceans, 
I am mainly trying to appeal to people who don't care about other fish. I think that people should care about these other fish more. I'm just saying even within your own set of morals, this is not the right thing to do. Anyway. Next, there's one thing that people love to see on labels, on products that they feel bad on some level about in terms of beef. It might be a grass-fed label. In terms of fish, we're talking about this Marine Stewardship Council sustainability sticker. Documentary, of course, covered this, and Emily says, misinformation is that the Marine Stewardship Council certification is too easy to obtain and not credible, when in fact the truth is that they are carried out by third-party auditors using publicly available sustainability criteria. The MSC issues are far-reaching, and Earthling Ed goes into more depth into those issues, but a few of them, for example, are how they make the majority of their money off of these certifications, so that's a major incentive. Also, these third-party auditors benefit from perpetuating the system, so it's kind of a win-win-win self-policing situation. And also that they've been known to give out these certifications just with fisheries that might, you know, hopefully someday reach the criteria, but haven't yet. Anyway, even the fishing industry has criticized this certification. You know, SavingSeafood.org, again, the industry, said it was corrupt and pay-to-play, so fun stuff. A French NGO by the name of Bloom also did a investigation, and the results are horrendous. Quote, our results unequivocally reveal the extent of the MSC label fraud. In stark contrast with its affirmations, the MSC label, in fact, mostly certifies industrial destructive fisheries. Yes, 80% of their certifications are given to industry fishing, including bottom trawl and destructive practices that we'll briefly cover in a second. Not sustainable in any way. And while we're actually talking about sustainability and trawling, which I could ramble about for as long as this whole video, it's just worth mentioning something I didn't see in the movie, and that is that trawling itself may emit as many greenhouse gases as air travel. All of it. And while we're on the topic of emissions, well, the movie did cover that carbon that is in the biomass of fish that's taken out of the ocean that would otherwise be sequestered. An estimate from a study here found that that increases the emissions of the fishing industry by about 25%, so that is no joke. And my all-time favorite just fact of life here that I have yet to see anybody even try to debunk is how cetaceans, these whales, are able to fertilize the ocean on a large scale, which leads to a massive amount of carbon sequestration. And you know, if we were to put a dollar number on these animals, we're talking trillions. But in terms of sustainable seafood, it appears it does not exist in this current system. At best, you can just be privileged enough to pay people to fish less than they otherwise would and then have a feel good stamp on it, or just lie to you about fishing with good practices. Another attack on Seaspiracy is that it is completely ignoring small subsistence fisher people. And that brings me to Ali's direct response on plant-based news. What we found is in the film that there are people around the world that that need to rely on, you know, fisheries to for sustenance, right? So we, we cover in the film people in West Africa who rely on them uh, and elsewhere. The problem is today, if, if you want to have the small scale fishery providing you fish regularly for your for your diet, times that by seven, eight billion people, you end up with the same problem. But the best option that we have to protect our oceans is to adopt a plant-based diet. The next one, one of the more nuanced ones I've seen is that actually it's not people's desire to eat fish that is driving all of this destruction. And so telling people to stop eating fish is nonsense. It's actually all just capitalism's fault. Well, I agree that capitalism absolutely puts an emphasis on profit over the well-being of people, animals, and the planet, and so on. The case here is that a large portion of this destructive fishing industry is directly fed by subsidies. And that means that even if you were in a different form of government or economic system, you could still be pushing this exact destruction. In other words, it is largely funded directly by government. So even if you're gonna change the form of government, the economic system, you could still have large forces at play that would lead to this destruction. And that is a direct result of the demand of people wanting to eat this stuff at all. Now from the UN, again, echoing that 90% of the world's marine fish stocks are now fully exploited, overexploited or depleted. They say there's no doubt that fishery subsidies play a big role. So changing the way money flows doesn't solve this problem and the current system we live in is a capitalist system. So if you're gonna make the biggest change you can now, you can A, stop 
increasing the demand for fish or stop eating fish, and then B, try to do what you can to get these subsidies removed. In the end, there are so many topics I wish I had more time to cover, like whales and fish farms and fish fraud, but I think you're getting the point with these main attacks on the documentary. They just don't change what the logical conclusion would be, and that is to not support this industry. So no, it is not the case that any attack on a statistic here or there has brought down the fact that our massive large-scale attack on sea-based wildlife that we call fishing is too destructive to want to support. You know, the plastic, the ghost nets, the trawling, the emissions, the destruction of the natural carbon cycle, and on and on and on. These are things that the Earth would just be better off with if we didn't support. And in the future, as humanity, even from a selfish purpose, keeping the Earth intact, as they say, this spaceship Earth, would be the best choice. The main point of all of this is that the documentary did a great job of introducing people who are not thinking about the sea at all to the biggest issues of the sea. All right, I'm, I'm done rambling. Feel free to like and subscribe. Let me know down below if there are any major points that I missed or didn't respond to, and I will try to get to them. We'll see. All right, thanks for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, share this in response to some of these articles or whatever you want to do, and I'll see you next time.